All right, we are ready. Um, anyhow, we wanted to pick back up on some stuff that we had talked about, um, and we're going to kind of, uh, again, we're going to, we're just going to kind of pick back up on some of that stuff, and let's just get into this uh, and see where we go today. But uh, if you've been reading some of the Facebook stuff, you'll kind of have an idea of where we're at with all this. But uh, anyhow, let's let's start out with uh, some uh, short video here, um, and uh, I'll kind of give you an idea what's what's going on here with uh, some of the stuff that we had talked about. Uh, so anyhow, let's go with the. Gospel titles and authors. How did they get there? How did we derive or arrive or derive from what we had? So let's see what we got here. The titles and authors given in the Gospels of the New Testament read in most Bibles in large, bold texts. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of John. We as readers are led to assume, in some Bibles outright state, that these books were written by Jesus' disciples and direct eyewitnesses to the events they describe. Matthew being written by, well, Jesus' disciple Matthew, the former tax collector. John written by John, son of Zebedee. And in the case of Mark, a man connected with Peter, and Luke, named after a traveling companion mentioned by Paul in Colossians. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. As confirmed by early manuscripts of the documents themselves, originally, these Gospels were untitled. And now, I just want to see that that manuscript that he just showed you is from the Codex. Um, it's the Sinaiticus Codex, um, and these are the earliest manuscripts of the full New Testament that we have available to us, which, again, if you watched our last video, you would know this is about the mid-4th century, about 350 years A.D. not name any sort of author. They were written anonymously, and the authors, whoever they might have been, never wrote their names, nor did they write in the first person or insert themselves into the narratives. This was no secret, or even something that interested early Christians. It was likely assumed at the time that these texts were not written by the disciples or by anyone who had significance in Jesus' life. It's actually quite obvious that the disciples hadn't written these texts when one notes that they were written in Greek by educated Greek speakers likely outside of Israel, maybe from Greece, Asia Minor, or Egypt. Literacy in the ancient world was rare. By modern estimates, at the best of times in antiquity, only about 10% or so of the population was able to read, and most of these were concentrated in urban areas like cities, and not in the type of areas where Jesus' disciples might have been from. Keep in mind, most of them were fishermen and hard laborers in the countryside, by all accounts, peasants. The ability to read is one thing. In the ancient world, it was another to be able to write and compose a literary work. Few people in the first and second centuries would have been able to produce something like the Gospels. The few there were would have been from eastern cities of the Roman Empire, like Alexandria. Most scholars agree that none of the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, and more likely to have been written by urban Christians who were recording oral and written traditions, sayings, and stories about Jesus and his life passed down and compiling them in a unified text. The Gospels themselves are not apologetic about this. The Gospel of Matthew is written completely in the third person, using they to refer to the disciples, and never we. The tax collector turned disciple Matthew is never referred to as me, but instead just him. There is zero indication in the actual text that we are supposed to be led to believe this man also wrote what we are currently reading. Same thing with Luke and Mark. The author of the Gospel of John clearly makes a distinction between himself and his informant, an unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved, who was the source of the stories and traditions he is writing down at the end of the Gospel. The end of the Gospel of John reads like this, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is the disciple who has testified to these things and has written them. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. The anonymous author is simply stating he gathered this information for this text from an eyewitness of Jesus, and that he had not met Jesus himself. The author dictated the gospel from this individual, however they might have been. It was only traditions made decades after the construction that tried to tie names to these untitled and anonymous texts, 
and the names just stuck, even though there is no factual or textual basis for them, and the texts themselves explicitly argue against it. To early Christians, it didn't matter to them who the authors of these texts were. However, later Christians wanted to bring more authenticity to the documents by making their authors direct eyewitnesses to the events they described. They would essentially take names that are mentioned in the New Testament and say, yeah, that guy wrote this, with no corroborating evidence. The tradition in our modern Bibles of providing names and authors to the Gospels is just not accurate to the original text. I will continue to refer to these as Mark, Luke, etc. for the sake of brevity. Okay, so there is more information on this and the timeline when um, the Catholic, um, through the Vaticanus Codex, through all that, through the Vulgate, um, timeline where they actually did actually start putting names to the Gospels and the books. So anyhow, that's something that you can research on your own. Um, so that's that's one of the things. Let's let's see. Number eight. A couple more things I wanted to look at here. Number eight. Women omitted. It may be a surprise to learn that one of the major divisions in early Christianity was that of the role of women in the church. I don't want to get too far in the weeds here on the women thing. Um, not that it's not important, but it's not part of our uh, study here. Um, I'll just, I will point out the fact that, um, I want to move forward here a little bit. Um, and, and again, you, you can go out and watch this video and you can get informed all you want. Um, I'm, I'm not saying this, this video, I've validated anything here. I'm showing you what is out there. Um, and some of these things where um, it is likely that people have added and taken parts away. They lead a good, um, I don't want to say argument, but the uh, reasoning um, and, and show you actually parts. Now, you can also, and I have watched these too, um, that's why I'm comfortable putting this out. I've watched a guy that says um, he's went out and refuted this actual person's uh, work that we're video watching this video, and he's got a couple more videos, and the guy goes through these things um, as he goes through uh, some of these uh, instances and he tries to uh, sometimes he has a point and other times I think he's doing exactly the same thing he's accusing this guy of doing saying that why he's not right he's doing the same thing he's saying this guy's not right by so if you understand what I'm saying there so anyhow yeah so you're going to find flip coins you're going to find biases you're going to find people that's unbiased that are just giving you the facts so you have to sort that out uh, you are going to stand before Jesus Christ one day by his words, and you're going to give an account for every deed done in your body, just like I am. And, and I'm going to bring this out. I'm just showing you. Uh, I'm bringing out what I learn and, and, and sharing this with you so that you will know, and you're not going to be snookered by these fake people that want to assume authority in your life as a pastor, priest, or any other authority claiming in the name of God that they have something to teach you that you can't be taught by the what we have available to us as a resource, the Bible uh, in this case. And I, I glean most of my stuff through the Bible, but not everything. And what I do glean from the Bible, the Holy Ghost is a check for me. It's a check and a balance whether or not this is true. And, and I, I depend on God. I have not thrown a filter up of man to, to only allow God to, well, God, I know that can't be true because my pastor said it couldn't, and I know you work through my pastor. Well, that's, that's the fix many of you are in, and I was in for years myself. And I pray for you. I pray for you today uh, in the name of Jesus. Um, so, yeah, that's that's some of the stuff, and 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 just let let's just just a second here. I just want to go through, touch on this here real quick. The place that is called the skull, they crucified him there, along with criminals on his right and on the other on his left. And Jesus said, "Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing." Jesus's prayer, "Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing," 
It is often seen as an illustration of Jesus' compassion and kindness towards those who are killing him, displaying forgiveness where most would seek vengeance. It's a very nice quote, and personally one of my favorites. However, this line curiously is missing in some of the older manuscripts of Luke. The earliest Greek copy, Papyrus P75, dated to about 200 AD, as well as a few other later texts, completely lacks the prayer of forgiveness, reading like this. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals on his right, the other on his left. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. But the prayer exists in other copies, such as the Codex Sinaiticus. So this raises the question, was the prayer originally in the Gospel and then removed in some versions? Or was it not originally in the Gospel and then added later in some versions? So, so this, is, this is one of the things that I do like about this guy. Um, in some instances, and I, I don't know this guy's background, I really don't. Um, I'll tell you that right off the bat. But in some of these things, it appears appears that he doesn't have a dog in the fight on a lot of this stuff. Now, when you listen to the other guy, uh, he doesn't really say he has a dog in a fight about it. But I know the other guy does have a dog in a fight. Um, he is religious, and he tries to... Um, let's just say he pulls in a lot of stuff that are, again, in themselves not verifiable either but says that, oh, well, we, we, we draw this conclusion because, you know, oh, you know, this, this person talked about it, and he'll name the person, and he'll, he'll give the book or whatever that, that was read, or, or, um, and, and he'll give that, but, you know, to base what this guy said off of his book, um, and regardless, um, he, he pulls in certain things, and that's how they have arrived or derived some of these, these things and put them together and says, oh, well, this is why they added these things, because they, in my term, what he's saying, they assumed, and we knew all that about, know what that means. So anyhow, I, I, that's, that's where I draw the line. This guy's trying to correct this guy in some of these things, and I... I some things, like I said, you have to be the, you got to be the arbitrator of, of who's right, who's wrong. Pray about it. If it's not a salvation issue, I guess it doesn't really matter, does it, right? Um, seek the Lord in these things because, again, there's no man, me or anyone else, that's going to stand before you and God in that day. You ask God, be honest and humble with your heart without filters, and let God direct you. And if it's an issue that God wants you to know or, or whatever, he'll, he'll give you this. Uh, just like he gives these things to me. And I'm just bringing them forth. For things are divided on this. The motivation surrounding the alteration All right, so let's move on here. here. I just want to kind of just give, give that short point here. Um, you did the Jewish people for crucifying Jesus. These... So he, he makes a point that maybe they put it in because they didn't want to, to get the word out. They may have wanted to, and that's what they're talking about here, and that's why I'm just going to quickly go over this with you. Um, he's saying that maybe they put that in there just to appease, to not accuse the Romans uh, that God didn't forgive them or something like that, but this may have allowed the word to go forward, and it's not accusation to people and try to destroy the uh, the stories that was that was moved forward. So anyhow... Things like that. Let's see what else. At some point. Is our modern version wrong? Or are the older versions incorrect? We don't know. Number six, the Johannine comma. The Trinity or the Christian Godhead is a central doctrine in most sects of Christianity. Again, I'm going to leave some of this to you if you want to research it. Um, get in the word. Go through, research his stuff. It's good for you. Um, if you're used to just taking what man says, get in the word yourself. Go research his stuff. The New Testament that outright state the doctrine of the Trinity appears in chapter... Again, I am not interested in these quibbles back and forth. I do not think that's important. I think it, this is something that religion... Uh, 
wants to divide people on so that they can get you to come to their assembly or that assembly. I think this, uh, I believe there's only one God, one faith, one baptism. Um, now, it does say that in the Bible. It says it like in one place. Is it backed up by three different places? The word, um, three that bear record in heaven, we've got that one, was uh, the word. So there, there are, you know, I, I know all these. I used to argue the fact with these Trinitarians. So I, I'm well versed in, in what we used to use to talk to these people and, and tell them that, hey, there's only one God and, you know, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. I know it all, people. I've, I've been there. I've been arguing with these people for years. I, I was a preacher in the UPC. I held a license. Um, you know, I, I know these things. That's that's what, maybe that's why God is using me to to bring this forth because I already have been there. I've, I've He is I don't know what Moses learned on the backside of that desert, but I can tell you one thing. Uh, if God has found a use for me to do this, I'm doing it. So uh, this, is, this is where I'm at today. I'm nothing special. Um, I don't consider myself special. Um, this is what I'm living, and I'm sharing it with you. And uh, I would just say that don't be snookered by what is a church today because it's not what Jesus taught. There is not one place in the scripture where Jesus said for you to go to a place to worship. Matter of fact, contrary to that. Four, there are three witness bearers, and, the and spirit and the water and the blood. There's the scripture. And I, again, like I said, I don't want to get too far the into century, some of this stuff. And in Greek manuscripts in the 15th to the one we see in the Codex Veneticus, that one scribe calling the other an idiot. Whoever. Yeah, so some of the translation stuff, and we'll get back on that in a second. We'll, we'll go back to that. But hold on, I just want to finish out this video real quick. As a marginal note, in some Latin manuscripts during the Middle Ages, similar to the one we see in the Codex Veneticus, that one scribe calling the other an idiot. However, over time the marginal note was either accidentally or intentionally incorporated into the actual text. So what he was just talking about, there are words that... Um, these translator scribes have changed a word uh, because they felt that that original word was more meaningful in this way to the writing than the word that was there. So they changed it to another word. It doesn't change the whole meaning, but it gives a better, in their thought, at the moment, they thought went flowed better with the, the story that was going into that thought. And so, anyhow, then you got another scribe or translator that come along and, and, and proofed it or what have you, come back and erased it, and you could see these erase marks in the original transcript. This is what this guy's talking about. And he's erased it and put a little footnote saying, hey, you know, this idiot, and they call each other idiots and nincompoops, uh, my words, um, and, and goofballs, whatever, in, in the notes. And so you can, you can literally see um, the thoughts behind some of these changes that are happening here. So just in, and now we're talking about a copy of a copy. And I know in my other video, I said copies of copies of copies. Well, this guy basically states copies of copies. Uh, so he thinks there's only three iterations. He thinks each, I don't know how they arrived at this, um, but he, he says, First century, second century, and then the third century. We have the third century, um, middle of the fourth century, basically. So we have the 350 AD. The, the Vaticanus is uh, supposedly 330 AD, and then the Sinaiticus is 350 to 360 AD. Um, on the timeline that we have that they've established. So I don't know, he says like the third iteration or copy, this would be the second cop, third copy, one, two, so I guess it'd be the second copy, which would make it the third. Uh, how they arrived at that, I have no idea. I have not researched that or I have no rhyme or reason. Maybe it's copied 10 times. Maybe it wasn't just once every 100 years like they're assuming here. And again, I don't know how they arrived at that. So either way, 
if it was every 100 years, then this is the third copy that we have the latest and greatest of. So again, these are all sayings from the beginning. No one was there dictating notes. Jesus, the words coming out of Jesus' mouth as he was talking. It was Aramaic, uh, was the common uh, language there. And so this was all transposed into uh, Greek and then converted into English, um, translated into English. So all these things, they, they went back to Greek and went back and cross-referenced to he Hebrew or Greek words and, and all these translations. And again, like I said last time, 1611 was the King James Version, which neither one of these codex um, manuscripts were available at that time. So um, it was going along with the, um, the, Vol uh, the Vulgate. Um, and that's, that's what I'm showing you there. So uh, let me see if I can actually see if that comes out a little bit or I can see the timeline. Yeah, so here you go. You've got... Um, see the Dead Sea Scrolls, but anyhow, here, here is kind of... In ...older versions of the Bible, buried in ancient houses or in caves dated all the way back to the first century AD and BC. For instance, we have the... Okay, so let me go back just a hair, but... And there are other other uh, videos and, and breakdowns of, of these timelines, and this is this is pretty close to what they're saying too. Um, so you can go in and really, really get into this if you want, and you can see that these, how these things are, how that they have went through the iterations. All of them being able to trace back to the original texts created thousands of years ago. For instance, we have the Vulgate, a Latin version of the Bible used in Catholic churches, which shares a common origin text with the MT, but contains unmistakable differences. Archaeology has been of crucial importance to biblical scholarship for hundreds. So what you can see here, you can see how some of this stuff was brought down. Um, you can see that the Codex Vaticanus, which I was telling you was about 330 um, AD, and then CE is Common Era, and then you see the Codex Sinaiticus, which is down, uh, which is about 350, 360 AD. And then you have, off, based off of that, the Codex Vaticus, which is Greek, um, Vaticus. What does that mean? The Vatican? Yeah, sure. So what you're looking at is, is this here was the, the writings that was hidden from the people for so long. The Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic, the, um, they were keepers of this. They hid it. They would not let people see it. Um, and then when this was... This was um, uh, made visible when they were able to see this. This is when the Reformations, this is when your Wesleyan and all these other uh, reformers start coming out um, and breaking off from the Catholic. And, and so here you have all these things was, was Codex Vaticanus down to the Vulgate. Now it wasn't. This was not taken off the Sinaiticus, which was somewhat different than the Vaticus. So there are some differences there. And uh, in, in my humble thoughts, and, and I, I do not have, I will not stand here and say, sit here and say I have total proof and beyond the shadow of a doubt, but in my surmisings, I will tell you that I believe that that Codex Vaticus, when it was brought down to the Vulgate, Latin Vulgate, um, for the Catholic, I think that was changed. I think there were things, and I think things were rearranged to where it fit man, priest, church. And I think that's where we have these churches today. And I think that's where a lot of these things were, were manipulated. And uh, again, I have not went into a study. I'm not a Hebrew um, expert. I'm not a Greek expert. And, but... I see through the pages of, of the scripture and what I have read and what I do know of Jesus to the best of what writings we have, 
I can see it through the pages interwoven through those pages that I've talked about in the past, that how a lot of these things have been manipulated, even to the extent of the words of Jesus himself. So that is, that is something, my friend. So you, you've got to really, uh, that's, that's why Jesus put such an emphasis that the spirit of truth, when he is come, he will lead and guide you into truth and righteousness. The Holy Ghost, because he knew what men were capable of and what they would end up doing. And that is why we must be born again of the Spirit. That's why Jesus made that mandatory. Years, archaeologists have been uncovering older versions. So the- again, what he's talking about here is even though we have these, these, these are complete, these codexes are complete, the Sinaiticus has about half of the Old Testament in it. It has nothing of Genesis in it. Uh, I think it goes all the way up to uh, about half of the Old Testament. I can't remember the book it starts at. But anyhow, it only has about half of the Old Testament and none of Genesis and the whole New Testament, which means Matthew, doesn't say Matthew, of course, uh, all the way to Revelation. Um, And these are very similar um, from what I am told, what I'm finding out from these videos um, are very similar. And uh, so, again, I can only say that, you know, like like when you go to Mark um, 16, it ends at 8. It ends at verse 8 in the Kodak Sinaiticus. It ends there. There is no 9 through 20. And they have, they decided, the translators have decided that, hey, it shouldn't end with just the ladies walking away. Um, And so again, this other guy and these people that do have a dog in the fight decided, hey, you know what? We need to add something to that. It makes sense that Oh, well, we can extract from this and from this writing and those writings and, oh, what this person said, what that person said. Oh, well, that'll be fitting there. That, that, that would make more sense. We don't want to confuse the writer because, you know, God's not the author of confusion, right? So they have played with this stuff. And so this is what we got today. And it is massaged for you to go to church and you to be the sheep that you're supposed to be. And they have created these pastors and, and all these things that, that you could look up and, and continue on with the priesthood that Jesus abolished. And uh, it looks like we've been a little longer than I wanted to be already. Um, but anyhow, nonetheless, uh, let, me, let me jump off this video here. Uh, again... I'm going to do more on some of this stuff here, and uh, I think I think that it, it's a good thing. Um, so anyhow, let's go with, let's talk about where in the scripture does Jesus tell us that we need to go to church? Where does he say we need to go to a place? Um I, I don't want to hear Jesus was found in the in the synagogues uh, talking with the lawyers and all this stuff at a young age and all this stuff. He was growing up. He wasn't teaching. wasn't um, um, at, at the opportunity. Jesus read uh, Isaiah and said, "This day is this uh, scripture fulfilled in your ears." He was he was giving them. He was teaching. He was preaching to them that day. And letting them know to put it on record that he was here and uh, that uh, they should take heed. But they didn't. And uh, But anyhow, that is on record. And uh, if you wanted me to come to your church and tell you why you shouldn't have that church, I would be more than glad to do that. I would be more than glad to say that you needed a relationship with Jesus, not the church. And uh, I, I, would, I would give you truth. Um, and I would tell you what you should know about Jesus and not what uh, the man wants you to know about the church, the building, and, and those things. But anyhow, not one passage do you find Jesus directing anyone to a church, uh, to an assembly, 
Um, again, I've given you why some of these things I don't feel, even though they're written, are, are honestly associated with what Jesus had, where you guys are pulling, where the church religion is pulling these things across the line and saying, oh, well, this is, this is said here, or this is insinuated, whatever. No, I don't, I'm not buying it. So anyhow, not one passage of scripture ever directed someone to a temple, church, or synagogue, okay? Um, the scripture where it does say to meet in Jerusalem, um, let's go here to John 20 and 19, and I have that up right now. Um, and you say, well, that was the purpose to get the Holy Ghost. This was the, where they were supposed to assemble and... So it did happen, as the writer says, and what was told. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it didn't happen that way uh, or something similar to that. Um, I'm just telling you that's not the only way that it could have happened. And we're going to read this scripture right here, and you don't have to believe this scripture if you don't want to. Um, but this is a scripture in John that says, John 20 and... Uh, We'll go 19. Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed. He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, verse 23 is one of the scriptures that I do have an issue with. Um, so let's, let's, let's focus on 22 real quick before we get into that next scripture. But 22 said he breathed on them. So there's that breath when you go to John 3 and, and read about um, Nicodemus. Jesus talked to Nicodemus. You must be born again of the water and the spirit and how he explained how the, the difference was from uh, being born of the water and of the spirit and how the, the wind and, and, you know, we have that reference in, in Acts um, where we see the 2 and 38 where they was all together in, in an upper room and, and where they... Um, the Russian mighty wind that filled all them. Okay, so we have that reference of the wind, but here Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And there, did they, did they disobey him? Did they not receive the Holy Ghost? I would have to say that they received the Holy Ghost right there. Those that were in that room obeyed Jesus and received the Holy Ghost through his breath. He breathed on them. Now, I know this, this kind of messes some of y'all's theology in your little preaching uh, world up because you, you have this little theology that this, this differs in your church and your religion, and this is why your church is right and the other churches are wrong. But you're going to believe the word or you're not going to believe the word, but here it is. And, and some of those things, and I know, you know some of you are going to say, well, you're not believing the next verse. Well, if, if this thing is right, it's going to go with, with the nature and the purpose of Jesus Christ. There are things that we know are just out of kelter. And I'm going to explain that. Verse 22. Let's talk about verse 22 real quick. And when he had thus said, he breathed on them. Verse 23. I'm sorry. Whosoever sins ye remit. So he's basically, they're saying that Jesus said, whoever sins you, you forgive, they're going to be forgiven. And whosoever sins you retain, they're going to be retained. Now, I have a problem with that because the fact that when Jesus, when, when Jesus said, thy woman, thy sins are forgiven, he was immediately, they started throwing stones at Jesus. Because they said he blasphemed God because only God could forgive sins. Now, we know those of us who have had the revelation knows that Jesus was God. Now, I know these disciples are not God. 
Now, you either believe that only Jesus, God, can forgive sins, or you believe that forgiveness is passed down to anyone that gets the Holy Ghost. I'm not on that boat with you. And if you believe that, then I guess you're a man God yourself, and I think you have bigger problems than missing the scripture here. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave it at that. Um, now, um, so Jesus went to Samaria to the woman at Jacob's well, okay? And he told her that she said, we come here to worship. Because our father Jacob uh, dug this well, and so we feel close to God, basically, is what she's saying, that this is, this is where we come to worship. And Jesus said the time will come, and now is, that when the true worshipers will neither worship here nor in Jerusalem, okay? But God is seeking people to worship him from their heart. So it doesn't matter about the place. So this is another reason why church is not the thing, folks. A place is not the place. And God ain't seeking you to go to a church. That is not what pleases God. And this, this whole crux of, hey, you know, assemble yourselves together in the manner of some such is, this is all part of that man thing. They need you to be there so they have an audience. They need you to be there so they can come out in their long robes and their nice suits and, and on the platform. Doesn't that, doesn't that fly in the face of entertainment on itself, being up on a platform with these some places or or ornate chairs like King's Thrones? I've seen them. I've been in those churches. Um, and, in, in, you know... Again, I'm not going to go into all that. I've been there, done that, seen that, heard that. Man, these, these guys just pat each other on the back three quarters of the service. and uh, which, which, okay, this, this is a good segue because this leads us right into Paul. Um, let's talk about one more, one more quick, quick uh, quip here or uh, uh, mention. Philip was what we would call modern day, Philip was in revival. They were having great, and the Bible said the Spirit carried him away, or led him away, called him away, and he went to the Ethiopian who was sitting in the desert on a chariot, okay? Um, and because he was visiting, and so Philip was led to him and asked him, do you understand what you read? And you can go find the story. You can read it. It'd be good for you to get in your Bible um, instead of just listening to other people. And uh, But you see here that Peter had every, or uh, Philip had every opportunity to say, hey, listen, come on back. Man, you got to hear this cat preach. Man, we are having a hold down back here at this service. You just, Man, it won't take 30 minutes to get there. And, and you'll be back in time, but what, what, what do you got to do anyhow, man? They'll, they'll, you'll, you'll find out all kinds of stuff. Man, this guy, cat preaching, man, he's on fire and all this stuff. Dude, didn't happen. You're not finding it in the pages of your Bible. You keep listening to man, and you're keeping getting further and further and further from not only the truth of what the same disciples you claim to follow, but apart from Jesus and the intent of your life. So here you are, here Philip is, and he just begins speaking of him about Jesus. Okay? There we are. Now, beautiful segue. Let's talk Paul. Last one we talked about, and I've, I've made some statements on, on Facebook. If you're not on Facebook, um, maybe I'll get these in the next time. But, but we talk about Paul's disciples. When, when the writer, Luke, supposedly, or whatever, whoever this character is that wrote Acts and 
Uh, maybe, maybe not the book of Luke 2. I'm not sure anymore. Um, that's what they say because of the style of writing and stuff. And I don't know, maybe, maybe so. I'm not going to say not. But when you look at Paul, and I'm not going to go into his conversion and stuff. That That's just unbelievable to me. Jesus is not bringing um, harm and fear to convert you. That's That never happened in the pages of the Gospels, uh, according to uh, these writers or these sayings, okay? So, um, when you go, and I spent about, I don't know, half an hour plus today just kind of Googling out some of the scriptures, just seeing what what um, what's out there just just to kind of validate some of some of the things that already never seen. But you kind of the writer kind of brings you to because you know Paul's continually, you know, in the beginning is a lot of these uh, things and books of his attributed to or or uh, apocryphes. Um, is saying, you know, the Lord Jesus, a, a, a servant of Jesus and all this stuff, and try to establish this up here. And then you go in and it says, um, you know, you look at, well, what what miracles did Paul have? What miracles did Paul do? And, you know, I was like, well, let's, let's dig into this a minute. Let's just, on the surface, we're not digging deep here. It's just on the surface. Read your Bible. And I'm like, where... Did Paul invoke the name of Jesus? Because we know he never talked about Jesus' family. We know he never talked about Jesus' miracles, his exorcisms. None of those things that Jesus did did Paul ever mention. Um, and I'm like, wait, hmm, I don't remember Paul really even talking about invoking the name of Jesus. So I did a quick little search and look up and read the scriptures. And lo and behold, guess what? You know, Paul has disciples, uh, just like Jesus had disciples. And there's this parallel, and I've talked about this before. There's, as you read in Paul's conversion and between with King Agrippa and all this, you almost start feeling for Paul like you felt for Jesus as Jesus was being led to the cross and going through these court systems. And then when you go through, you got Paul going through the court system, parallel to Jesus, and you start having these same feelings and almost tears for Paul. I did. I remember when I first started reading the New Testament, and it's like, oh, Agrippa, you know, I would that you would, you know, uh, know Jesus and stuff. And, and, and when you look at that, and, and, and you look at it that, and it's like, you know, Paul, and, you know, you just start feeling sorry for Paul, and you'd be thinking that, you know, and, and almost some transformation happens that Paul becomes this hero. And to the level that Paul becomes this, like Jesus or replaces Jesus. And that, to me, is what the writer was trying to do because when you follow on and you begin to see the, the things that are attributed to Paul, so when, let me, let me go for a couple instances here. Again, like I said, you'll hear a whole lot about I'm the servant of Jesus Christ and all this stuff, but you don't hear what you won't hear is Paul invoking the name of Jesus. So Paul, um, miracles or the intents that happened, uh, one, when he caused blindness, okay? Remember Paul said he was blinded and thrown off the horse or the donkey or the camel, whatever he was riding um, on the road to Damascus. Uh, and then later on, Paul calls blindness to someone else. Um, he didn't invoke the name of Jesus, which I don't think either one of those was part of Jesus, uh, either his conversion in that manner or this guy's blindness because Jesus never made anyone blind. He always healed blindness. He, he restored 
sight. Um, and then number two, crippled man uh, from birth, Acts 14 and 10, right? Um, the one in Lystra, okay, he never invoked the name of Jesus there either. Uh, just says, Paul healed him. <laughs> um, whether it said he prayed for him or not. And, and at the most, you'll see that God gets the credit, not Jesus. Okay? Um, and when you go to Acts 28 and 8, the third one that I, that I ran upon today, Publius, or Publius, however you say it, his fever was healed, but neither was that ever invoked by the name of Jesus, by Paul. So you have these... Um, but you don't find Jesus mentioned. So some of you, if, if you don't think that's odd, you really should think that's odd because this is not preached on. None of this stuff is brought up. So these things here, there, 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 is, there is some really big questioning that should be going on. And uh, I'm just going to say, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm going to end this today. But uh, man, y'all y'all gotta y'all gotta look at these things because this this stuff is important. Y'all being drugged through the mud here with with uh, with some bad things that that you need to you need to seek God for. You need to quit looking and and relying on these people lying to you. And uh, so I, I'm just gonna say you know. You really, you really got to look into these things. And I am going to continue bringing these things to light as they, they come to light for me. And I'm going to share these things. Uh, I'm not asking for anyone to follow me. I don't want you following me. I want you to find Jesus. I want you to have a relationship with Jesus, not a church, not some pastor. Those are unimportant. Those are important for you not to do. Um, so with that, um, thank you for watching, and I hope you seek out the Lord in um, communicating with Him. Get a relationship with Jesus, not a church. And again, if you want to use a church or whatever for a resource, just don't use them for your, your relationship with Jesus. These may be tools for some of you to not feel lonely and you want to be around people or whatever, but they're, they're really, they should be no different. They should be no higher than, than going to a skating rink once a week and having friends there or going to, to the, the VFW, you know, if you found a good place with people that aren't, you know, cussing and doing things that you don't feel that are, you know, up and up and the way you'd like to live. Those things there are, are, are things that you can go to, you know, maybe you'd like to go fishing or something you got a group of fishing buddies or maybe go meet at mcdonald's or something with some people that that have like interests that you have and, and and nobody's being you know vulgar speaking and trying to chase women and do all that stuff that that you know is ungodly those, those use that as a resource if you will but the point is is don't let them drag you into thinking that is your relationship with god because it has not in the bible that way not from Jesus. They have led people away from Jesus. It leads you away from Jesus in the scripture. And this is what they play with. So God bless you and seek him. Seek him only. He is the only one. Go in peace in Jesus' name.